OK. Let me pull the questions. So just to make sure that we're on the same level with everyone else, Minoj, give me the couple of lines introduction to what is generative AI and why are we talking about it right now? Why, where was it a year ago? Yeah, so generative AI is um, one of the most significant evolution of AI. People have been doing AI for 75 years. Bob and I were talking about expert systems and all. Generative AI is the ability of machines to start understanding language uh, and start creating new forms of um, responses and hypotheses. So it's not a deterministic system. So everything we have built in the last 75 years in computer sciences was rules-based. So when you ask the qu question, what is 2 plus 2, the computer will always say 4. If you ask the question, what is 2 plus 2 of a generative AI system, first time it might say it's 4. Second time it might say it's a configuration of a car. Third time it might say it's the definition of a family. So we are moving to a world where the machines are able to understand language and start interacting with us in a whole new manner. And I believe this is fundamentally going to transform us as a species. So what's new? I mean, we've been had computers for the last, I don't know, 70 years in some shape or form, maybe 100 if you think about it. Why a year ago suddenly it became a part of our life that everyone is, what, what happened? What's new about it? Yeah, I think last year we had what I call as the iPhone moment of, of AI. Um, you know, back in the day, I'm dating myself, when Netscape browser was launched, that was the beginning of the internet, the commercial internet. Before that, it was a gopher terminal all of us used to use. So chat GPT is the Netscape browser moment of the next generation of the web, uh, where there is not just about information, it's about connections and creativity. And why it came about last year, one was, I think, was a brilliant amount of um, engineering and work that was done by the team at OpenAI to create this entire new interface to information. Just like HTML was a new interface through a browser, chat is going to be the new interface to all applications and devices. So that was one marker. The other reason why it's become available now is the drop in cost of compute power. You know, for five years ago, for about $1,000 a month, you could get the capacity of a bee's brain on, on, a, on, a, on a cloud. Last year, you could get, for $1,000 a month, the capacity of a mouse's brain. In two more years, for $1,000 a month, you'll get the capacity of a human brain in the cloud. So the compute cost, as they have come down, it has given the opportunity to build these large language models and train them so you can start engaging in a whole new fashion. Eli, you've been in the space of AI for the last, who knows, like years, decades, I think. So did you see it coming? Like if I asked you, if you were in the stage a year ago and I asked you what would be the big thing of the year 2023, would you tell me, yeah, AI is the big thing? Well, I think every single person in the field will tell you yes, and they will almost all be lying to you, right? Because there is, yeah. there is always the sort of phase change that occurs anytime something reaches a certain level of capability, right? And so, you know, I used, GPT-2, it was not very good. I used GPT-3, it was much better. Um, and if you use GPT-4, it was radically better, right? And the, you know, the interesting thing about this is human capability is, is a spectrum, right? And to say, okay, I want to reach human capacity in any particular skill, you actually don't have to be that good to reach uh, some percentage of people, right? And so the thing that people were surprised by, I think, this year was that actually we're now at like 70% for a lot of these tasks where it's actually better than most people, right? And so that's where it starts to become more of an impact on society. Can I just add something to it? I think the benchmark on using humans to measure things, I think in five years we'll look back and laugh at it. Um, it's like trying to today compare a human against a car. How fast can you run? You don't today. Or how you compare it against an airplane, right? So I think we are at that stage where we're just using us, but that's not even 5% of what's ahead of us. So give me a What's a benchmark? What, what should we kind of... We, we use ourselves, I think, because we are human. Give me a benchmark that you say, okay, when it does this, I think we crossed another mile. Is there, like, is there a clear kind of like when we can, if it's a plane, when it can take off or get to 300 miles per hour, when it's 
AI, what would be a benchmark and say, okay, we achieved another milestone? Yeah, the popular concept around it is this notion called AGI, artificial general intelligence. And um, I, for one, don't um, subscribe to that because there's a lot of nuances it misses. Um, but AGI represents the ability of an AI system that will be the world's best at everything from an architecture to claims processing to uh, mopping a floor to uh, driving a self-driving car. It will be the best at every business function and every human function possible all into one AI. So that's supposedly the benchmark. And my mind is even that doesn't go far enough. It's far more powerful what's coming in the next 20 years. Okay, so you gave me the, the beginning of what I was to start with, which let's start with the extreme, perils and promise. So like, give me the kind of thing that we think, okay, this is a kind of whole, like, cure cancer, or something that we say, okay, this, th th this we couldn't do without, and it's amazing, promise, and then the kind of the worst case scenario that we see in Hollywood movies that you imagine are real. Uh, there are an enormous number of jobs that most people don't want to do, right? And this is always the challenge is you say like, okay, who wants to work in customer support? Based on speaking to the people who do that job, most of them do not, right? And so if you could eliminate the bottom 80% of that task where you eliminate the boring part, the repetitive part, and you leave only the most interesting pieces of it, then I think most of the people who do that work would be very happy with that result where they weren't having to just go through a script they were basically at the end of the script and the part where the script could not answer. That's on the promise. That's, That's on the promise, promise right? So the, you know, the challenge of that is that, of course, then you don't need quite so many people to do that job. So right now, you're in, in, in the space, you're in the business world of that. Do you see it as an opportunity and you kind of see, like, like what I hear from my friends, everyone says, like, I have a company that does carpenter carpenting, but, I, but I'm looking for AI in it. Is, there, is that kind of your experience that like companies all over the place are just kind of thinking, how do I also put AI on this thing? And if so, what would be the advice to the people here that are there? Well, th this has happened before, right? We've had exactly the same phenomenon you know, every sort of decade or so. People think it's now the time and we can use it for everything and it'll be great. And we can you know, fire 80% of our staff and save costs and the world will change. In reality, it, it doesn't, right? But we are now at the tipping point for a lot of these kinds of knowledge work tasks. So I think that it's our you know, intrinsic um, temptation as experts to say, oh, well, you know, this is being overblown because we have seen the entire trajectory of development, right? And it's only an incremental step in, in many people's minds. But in reality, we've reached a, a tipping point for a lot of things in the last year where things will actually have to change because the economic incentives will force them to. Manoj, I'm going to ask you a similar question. You're talking to a lot of companies right now. I hear everyone saying our company is now looking how to add AI. People in the room, give us a, a concrete advice. If you're in a company, you should start doing what to actually be ready for that. Yeah, I think first of all, um, again, going back to the internet and the web, 1998, about 1997 is when Mosaic browser was announced. And by 2000, every company was a web company, okay? Because everyone put a little browser interface and they said we're a web company. So it's a massive shift in architecture that every company, if, they, if you don't, if you're not a generative AI company, 99% you will be in two years. So part of it is it's like shifting from mainframe to client server, from client server to web, from web to mobile. This is the required shift. So that's table stakes. Broadly, if you're a company building stuff, I think there are three buckets of opportunities in which you can create value. One is what Eli just talked about, which is automation, you know, remove the boring work. And in boring, uh, one of my sayings is boring makes billions. There's a lot of boring processes like claims processing and stuff. There is billions of dollars you can make just by applying, just automating it. Then the second one is augmentation, which is improving your decision support so if you are a nurse working on a child with diabetes, having the AI tap you on the shoulder and say, you know, I've looked at 84,000 cases across the country, you may be missing this, consider this. So that's augmentation of human, uh, it's like the Iron Man Jarvis suit, right? Everyone having uh, the best um, you know, knowledge worker and she's telling you what to do. Then the third part, which I think is an exciting part, which is highly risky today, is the, is the transformation. 
is imagining a new class of things that um, the human beings have not thought about, new business models. Enelius Company is a great example. Go back to 1997, a business like his wouldn't have existed, right, because you didn't have the need. And there is thousands of companies like that that are going to come about that will be a completely, or simple things like Uber delivery. Uber wouldn't have existed if mobile um, cellular signals were not available, right? So there is a whole new class of transformative companies, and there's never a better time to be an entrepreneur. I never wanted to be younger, but now is the time I said, gosh, I wish I was 28. So, so maybe I'll, I'll follow up on this question. I, I was going to ask the two of you the same question, so I'm going to start with building on this. There are people here that are younger than 28. What would be the advice that you give a person who's basically entering the business, like finishing, I don't know, an MBA, finishing school, or even going to, to university? What should they learn? What would be the advice? Where they should kind of put their eggs right now to be ready for this thing in the year, coming years that are ahead? I'm going to ask you, and I'm going to ask you the same question afterwards. Do you have yeah. time to think? I think just to net it out, I would probably say, again, two or three things. One is become a lifelong learner. Keep learning. Build this capacity to learn and start reading up stuff, go to YouTube, there's tons of videos to just learn about what these technologies and capabilities are. So one is equip yourself to understand what this is all about. And I am convinced now, a year later, that this is going to be bigger than the internet, this transformation, right? And that's a big statement. Um, and so learn and, and really understand what's going on. Second is find your passion to a problem that you want to bring forward and solve for the world. Right? Uh, and, and you could do this in a big company, you could do it as an entrepreneur, not everyone has to be an entrepreneur, so you could be an entrepreneur, but find a problem that moves you at the core and start thinking about how do you apply that learning to transform that space. Right? A lot of entrepreneurs come to me and I ask them, why do you want to start a business? They said, I want to get rich. I said, go take a cold shower. Do not become an entrepreneur because money is the scoreboard. You got to love the game. And if you do, the scoreboard takes care of itself. So find a passion that you really want to solve for the world. It could be something personal that you experience that you want to go fix with this. The third and final one is surround yourself with a good team who can then go build a business to solve the problem. Whether in a large company or a small company, there is this African saying which says, if you want to go fast, you go alone. If you want to go far, you go with a group. Right, so find that tribe, find the group of people that you want to go. But are those things on. unique to AI world? Or, no, or I think it's a human endeavor. It's, it's common to a human endeavor. It's, if you're selling hot dogs in New York City on a stand, it's the same thing. So you wouldn't say anything different if I asked you three years ago. It's not that AI changed that. So Eli, I'm asking yeah. the same question. Young kids right now, would you give them the same advice, which is it doesn't really matter that this AI evolution is coming, or you say go learn Python? Well, I think everything Manoj says is good advice. Um, but the thing I would add is that you need to be flexible, right? Anytime there's sort of a shift occurring, you need to be spending a little more time to think about how what you're doing, how what, you're, how what you care about is going to change, and how you can change with it and even get ahead of that. And so the people who loved selling books 20 years ago, 99.9% of them are not selling books today, right? There are very few bookshops left there are a few, and those people who persisted thought, okay, what else can I do in this community? How else can I sort of bring, bring people in, create value, and create sort of a space that has additional benefits beyond just giving you a physical book, which now you can just order online and no one will come in just for that, right? And so if you really want to do it, you can almost always continue to do it, but if you think there's going to be a great compression where only the people who are really passionate about something are going to be left in that space, then you need to figure out what it is you're going to do that allows you to survive. Perfect. So now I'm going to shift to the other side of the same question. There's a question about AI kind of, so far it seems like very promising, beautiful and so on. There are some people who are terrified about that concretely right now. The Hollywood had a writer strike that was, a component of it was AI. I'm going to ask you regulation. Like what if I'm a company that actually is running with AI and so on, what should I be worried about in terms of regulation against me, or should I advocate for regulation that forward me? How do you approach this thing, which is like a guardrail against AI? It's a really interesting question, right? Because fundamentally, and this is only a temporary thing, but right now, all of our large models are trained on human output, right? In the future, they will not be trained on human output. But Today, you can say, oh, well, I wrote this book and it was in the training set, and therefore I should have some rights to output 
of maybe the entire model or similar outputs um, because I have some intellectual you know, property of some intellectual input into that process, right? I'll ask you just one question before you continue. Is there, is it, so I, you know, I asked GPT to write a poem and it gave me a poem and it used some, I don't know, website. Is there a way to know? Can, can, can I ask kind of somehow to know what drove my poem and who basically owns the under rights for that and somehow pay them royalties? Is it possible? Well, there's a lot of work on, you know, so-called explainable AI, right? And the, the answer is sort of yes. Um, it's not perfectly one-to-one, -one, but you can get pretty close. And we're working very hard to build these systems that are fully explainable, right? Where you can say exactly where everything came from, which is very important in, for example, in medical applications, you really want to be able to say, okay, this is the citation that produced this recommendation. Let me evaluate it and see if I agree with the citation, which will allow me to know if the recommendation is correct. Then you say, so the answer to the, to the regulation thing, you, you say we need to create some kind of a mechanism for that, and then we'll start asking somehow the, the, user, the, the creators of the AI to pay royalties to people, or we're going to uh, have people who work to create the data, or we're just going to gradually get people outside and start training it with other codes. Well, it, it's sort of a perverse problem, right? Because if you think about this at the limit, if a person is inspired by someone else's work, the, the originator does not necessarily have any creative rights to the inspired work, right? Um, this is a huge gradient in novels. There is absolutely no you know, claim in those cases in songs because the, there have been you know, attempts to effectively like copyright chord progressions that are universal. <laughs> There have been very bizarre cases brought, right? But for an AI, as you get closer and closer to, to sort of full intelligence, to what extent is this learning or is it inspiration? What extent is it reproduction, right? If it's not reproduction, why should there be a copyright claim? So I think absolutely, if you are a copyright owner, you should have a way to exclude your work from uh, training sets. And I think there should probably be, be some sort of uh, central registry that accomplishes that and penalties for violating you know, that expressed desire, but I think that in reality we're going to get much closer to what Japan does, which is to say, okay, there was a learning process. If I can't reproduce something that is more or less identical to the original source, then I did learn, I did not just copy. And probably we can't eliminate that from our capacity because we're in, you know, a larger you know, sphere and not everyone will make that choice and we will then be severely disadvantaged compared to people who did not make that choice. So Manoj, I'm gonna, you're basically trying to do something like that. You're trying to kind of create a tool that would allow us to, so to speak, stamp AI as how much it uses other people's work, what's good about it, what's bad about it, and so on. I just read a few days ago, speaking of what Eli said, that someone, I, correct me if I'm wrong, tried to create all the possible verses of music post and trademark all of them, and from now on everything is going to be uh, copyrighted because he did it. Yeah. How are we dealing with that? Like, so what, what's the solution that you're offering as a, as a, in a trusting yeah, So AI? I think there are two aspects to it. One is a commercial aspect, second is a tool aspect. On the commercial aspect, the, the, actually there are lawsuits going through right now where um, what constitutes creativity, right? So you know the famous picture of Andy Warhol and Marlene Monroe? So when he had done that, he took someone else's photograph and he added things on top of it, quote unquote prompts, from his creativity, and that was valued as a whole new product. Now the courts, what they're deciding now is what constitutes intellectual property is if I add prompts on top of an image, like I do in a dolly or a mid-journey, and the courts, the defense is saying that I can take any image out there and if I can do like you did to the poem, so I could take a published poem and I add enough prompts on it to say, no, make it in my tone, make it about Washington DC. All the layers of prompts that you're adding is the same thing as what Andy Warhol did by adding layers on that photograph. So I think that's the one aspect the courts are gonna decide. And by country, I think it's gonna be different. Um, the second aspect is the tools part. The important question to understand about these technologies is left um, unattended, these are going to be more destructive than nuclear power was. Uh, I call this the Chernobyls of AI that unfortunately are going to happen. Um, Facebook and what we saw with the hacking of our brain during the election cycle was the first Chernobyl. There are many more that are coming where humans are going to get hacked by bad actors by making you behave. I read. Uh, 
last month that there is a whole Tinder bot, that picture of a woman who chats with you, all the way down to payment saying, I'm in Africa, I'm stuck, my plane is gone, here's my bank thing, all automated with generative AI. And you now have new humans uh, that are, you know, so broadly the way I think about this, uh, and this is now my life's work, trustworthy AI. So um, this is something happened eight years ago that changed the direction of my life and I realized how all of us in the tech world um, are approaching it the wrong way. And to me, to kind of summarize without going on for a long time, there are three questions to ask. One, is it trustworthy? Can you trust the output of what the AI is saying? Because there is a problem called hallucinations. And um, there are lots of cases. So Google hallucinations in AI, and you will see lots of examples of how OpenAI and ChatGPT has got about 100 lawsuits against different people because of hallucinations. So if I can't trust my AI, I'm not gonna build anything in the enterprise that is mission critical. So number one is trustworthiness. And is there a hallucination detector? So one of my startups, I'm working on a spell checker for hallucinations, as I call it. So it detects it, scores it, tells you why it's coming from. You should say hallucination is? Sorry? We didn't explicitly state what is the hallucination in the context of generative AI, just say it in one sentence, so everyone knows what hallucinations are. Oh, the name of the company? No, so I'll say it just to make sure that everyone, hallucination is when, oh. the reason when you press, uh, write me a poem uh, for PopTech, you don't get always the same poem, is that embedded in the code is some randomness, so to speak, that basically goes in different directions and starts diverging from the code, and this is what we call in, yeah. in hallucinations. It, it makes up stuff. I mean, to use a crude word, the AI bullshits. Right, so when it doesn't know it, uh, and we have seen this, I had slides that we're gonna skip now. We are working with NHS England, so for drug um, questions, it's coming up with drugs for a cancer patient that are for skin allergy and made up drug names that don't even exist. So when people are using it for self-care, imagine the damage it can cause. So the first issue is hallucination for trustworthiness. The second issue is alignment. Is it aligned to the core values of humanity, of your corporate brand, and after the regulations that you're applying it. So the first is safety, second is alignment. And the third one is output, uh, effectiveness. Is the juice worth the squeeze? You know, can you build something with it that delivers enough business value that the six million that you need to retune the model and do all that stuff, is it worth it? So to me, sort of those are the simple questions, you know, is it safe, is it aligned with your values, and is it effective from an economic perspective? And because we have election in a year, do you think a product like this will be, like to avoid the next Chernobyl, do you think we are equipped to have tools that will help us prepare for the next Chernobyl? We are not, but we are getting there fast. I think, uh, unfortunately, the way civilization moves forward is through enforcements and disasters and regulations to some extent. In the opposite so order. if you're waiting for regulations, it'll take forever. Right, so when I saw, with due respect, one of the congressmen here two years ago, asking how he can put an email into a WhatsApp, I was like, not gonna wait on regulations, right? Nothing's gonna happen for a while. So it's gonna come down to disasters and enforcement. And disasters are disasters, there'll be lawsuits and people will have to start. So uh, I do about 40 or 50 of these talks with boards and CEOs. Their number one worry is, how am I not a front page news? The United Healthcare, you know, largest healthcare company here, they got a massive lawsuit against minorities saying that for the same condition they were being discriminated by the AI. So they don't want anything like that. So, uh, so the, the disasters part is, is, is clear. I think it's something that companies have to put new risk management systems in place. So I call this whole space cyber safety rather than cyber security. And my view is that in 20 years or maybe in 10 years, cyber safety will be as big a market as cyber security is. And uh, so we are beginning to see a whole new class of software systems to put guardrails. So I call it instead of building the uranium stockpiles, you're putting the domes on the nuclear reactors. There is a business for that. And Eli, I, I did injustice to your company by saying that all you do is uh, uh, stop people. But let me ask you first about this. Like, kind of the, the most, the easiest interface with every person in the room is this pop-up when it asks you, are you a human? Why are humans, are machines still losing to that? Like, isn't like it, it something that in a few months, days, machines, I, I already know of a case that the machine basically asked a human and tricked a human to do it for, for it. Is it not something that will be kind of obsolete in, in short time? Well, in reality, today we, 
will ask less than one in a thousand people to solve any kind of challenge like that, right? Because we're able to reach certainty using all sorts of other dimensions in most cases. But where it's really helpful is when you're not sure, right? And you need to collect more information. You need to collect motion data. You need to collect interaction data. You need to collect answers. You need to collect whatever it is that you can get. And as long as I can control the game you're playing, then the attacker has to adapt to my game, right? And if I can change it continuously, which is what we do today, is there's basically a sort of co-evolutionary process that occurs, right? Where every hour someone is adapting an AI system to try and break our systems, and we are automatically changing because we detect that, and we can sort of move into a different space on the map, right? What's the weirdest trick that you know of that someone tries to pass your systems? Like the weirdest story of someone using AI to create a some tool that will ask someone else, like, give me the weirdest one. Well, I think the most interesting ones are often where they are just tricking people in some way, right? So they'll, we, we, this is sometimes called like a triangulation attack, where basically you put the challenge you want solved on a completely separate website, and then you use the results of the person interacting with that to solve the actual challenge on the thing you care about, right? And that's a business, right? There's people who do that for... It's a very um, large business, yeah. The company is about seven years old? Yes. Why did you call it Intuition Machines? What was the insight seven years ago to call it uh, Intuition Machines? Well, so this is a great example of, like, was this inspiration or derivation, right? Since there was a company many years ago called Thinking Machines, whose trademarks all expired. Um, <laughs> And the, the trick to it was the thinking machine was not really thinking, it was just calculating, right? And the interesting thing about machine learning is it's not actually quite calculating, it's inferring, right? And it's more of a probabilistic process, and so it's really more about intuition. So, yeah. okay, so I think that, you know, my intuition is that uh, at the end of, of talks like this, there's so many ideas that I would like for you to give us kind of the one thing that you want people to leave the room and come ask you afterwards about it. What's the one thing that I think would be the, the one that you want to yeah. continue after the session that people should leave with? That's the memory I want them to take from this. I think it's one of the most exciting times to be a human this time. AI is going to make us more human um, because it's going to start bringing out of us creativity, intuition, innovation that a lot of the boring work today wires us down. Say two things. One is um, your work is going to get a lot more enjoyable. A lot of the boring stuff is going to go away. And there's a lot of talk about AI replacing us. I think that's not the real worry. There will be niches where it will be replacing us. But what will happen is you will be replaced by someone else who knows how to use AI. So start using AI, not because the machine will replace you, but because someone else will who knows how to use it. Those will be the two things. Thank you very much, the two of you. Thank you.